subscribe there as a lady because it looks like it's got some subscribe to I'm doing an interview for the AOD movie. I said I'm doing either an interview for the Stonewall or one of the two projects that they're going through with. They will be sitting with me here. Uh, what do you work for? Can you start? Can you give me your name and your social media? Uh, my name's Owen Levy, L E V Y, and my birth date is August 16th, 1946. I was born right here at uh, St. Luke's Hospital. The building I was born in no longer exists. It was called the Women's Hospital, and it was on Cathedral Parkway. So I basically have, uh, haven't moved very far from where I was born, so I'm living in Arizona. And uh, what took you, uh, where did you find the Stonewall? Well, it was, uh, I, I discovered later that I had a rather sheltered childhood. I thought I was rather, <laughs> I thought I was rather uh, more, uh, open than it was, but apparently my parents did uh, keep me rather sheltered, which was rare because of, because as a kid in New York, of course, I was in the village in my, you know, my mid-teens and so on, and there I knew no way around the city, so I mean, I used to, you know, when I first somebody could ride the subways, I was probably about eight or nine years old by myself, and after that, the, you know, it just became uh, pretty much... Uh, what I wanted to do in terms of uh, getting around socially. I, though I, li we lived in Brooklyn. I, we, I was born in Harlem, but we moved to Brooklyn when I was about five years old. And um, so I went to high, I went to did most of my education in Brooklyn. And um, we lived in a shady neighborhood. We were the first family of color to move to a block in Brooklyn, in Fort Greene, as a matter of fact. And, um, Again, I, again, I didn't realize that uh, I, I was black <laughs> until we were in the park one day. My two brothers were, uh, looked, you know, white, and one of the boys said to me, um, "Those, they're your brothers." He said, "But they're white," and I, that was the first time I realized that I did not look like my brothers, and that I was, uh, and, you know, I was the colored one. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> My my mother was a cosmetician. Um, my mother was a uh, born. She was born in this country, but she grew up in Bermuda. She was born in Massachusetts and grew up in Bermuda. Now I was raised by a stepfather, who I thought was my birth father until very late in life. My, as it turns out, my birth father is a comes from a very um, prominent South Carolinian family. I'm a Charleston member. That's how my cousin. That means well remembered for the as a as a well known family of color in in uh, Charleston. My Spell that. R E M B E R T. My uh, my uh, my father's uh, cousin, who he called me his nephew, he was the Episcopal bishop of the southeast. You know, all of his uh, relatives were either principals in, in the in public education system or or worked uh, in their own businesses. Um, so for, for me, that was quite a revelation when I discovered my Id real identity, because all along I assumed that my stepfather had been my birth father. That was my mother's secret, you know, I, I got a secret just before she passed away. And wow, so, so, your, so your stepfather was your birth father? Is that what you keep going No, my stepfather was not my birth father. My stepfather was the man my mother married shortly after I was born. Right because she, she really had no relationship with my real father. It was a, it was a casual thing. I won't go into the details here, but um, uh, uh, basically I was, a, I was an ass to her. I mean, I didn't, you know, she got her drink a little bit. She was just around town kind of thing, and suddenly here I am. And so what, uh, what was your, uh, what was your childhood like with regard to, with that, I'm sorry, not with kids, what was your childhood sort of young adulthood like with regard to sexuality? Well, I became active sexually uh, very early, I guess, now that I've been living in New York. I was about 14 and I was in the, my first, uh, well, technically I was um, molested or attempted to be molested when I was about four or five years old by an older friend of my older brother who was, was seven years older than me and, and his, and I was about four or five and his friend was about 14 or 15. And we were playing hide and seek, and he would always want to hide with me. And, uh, you know, I mean, you've got to remember, I was four or five years old. 
And he tried to get me to, do I, do you, do you really want to put this on tape, what I'm about to describe? Well, whatever you feel comfortable with. So you don't well, just let's say, he, let's say he attempted to make me do things um, that I would not do, or even back then I did not really know what I was saying. And I really did not remember thinking until years later when I was in psychotherapy and he did like a, a, a reverse thing and I re suddenly recalled the input. Um, and it was based on the fact that I had a very beautiful mother. And so um, he, the, whole, the whole idea of seducing me was to ask me what my mother looked like without her clothes on, or you know, what was her, in her lingerie drawer, you know, stuff like this, which is a four or five year old. I mean, I didn't really know what he was doing but years later, I, I, I started to understand what that was about. You know. And did, um, and you grew up in Manhattan, then, right? I, I grew up in Brooklyn, yes. Right. I was born in Manhattan, but we moved to Brooklyn when I was five. Yes. I grew up in New York City. Um, did you think, um, what were some of the biggest or earlier lessons you had with Jewish people or earlier interactions you had with Jewish people? Well, I li in, in, in the community I we moved to, Brooklyn had a lot of gay men living in it. Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Brooklyn Heights. This was a, a, a popular um, residential area for gay people who come to the city. Uh, some wanted to live in the village on the Upper East Side, but a lot came to Brooklyn, especially because of the Navy Yard. A lot of them were people who got out of the Navy and just stayed in, in downtown Brooklyn. Um, for, for me, it was a, a real education because when I met, as, I, as an older teen, when I started meeting um, older gay men, it, it gave me a view of the world that I necessarily wouldn't have, you know, as, uh, living as a, in a rather sheltered existence, which I didn't realize then was us. <laughs> and um, so uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, I think it was a positive experience, basically, of, of my teens learning about the gay life. And of course, like all, you know, I learned right away. Of course, you know, back then, we didn't have the internet. And uh, like every other person in my generation, we had to go to the library and look up the word homosexual and see, you know, where that would take us. I remember I tried to take out Giovanni's room when I was like 15 or 16, and, and it was behind the desk, the front desk of the library, and they wouldn't let me have it. Oh, really? Really? At 15, they wouldn't let me have it. The Brooklyn Public Library wouldn't let me read Giovanni's room when I was 16 or 16 years old. What was their reason? Well, because it was a book about homosexuals. That was, you know, that was just, that this, was a, this was still the early 60s. You know, this was not... Um, you know, we were considered uh, criminals to be gay back then, and also um, any sort of behavior was, was uh, you know, there were laws against uh, sodomy laws and whatnot. That's the whole emphasis of the whole Stonewall raid that night was because they could, you know, that kind of power, because they had this, these uh, regulations of how, uh, about, you know, about same-sex relationships. And so what, what was the age again uh, when you were talking to the, the riot? I was I uh, well, I was 21 when the riot started. That was the same June I graduated from college. I graduated in '69. What year was this? I graduated from Hunter College with a BA in English Literature. What was life like in the, the early '60s back then? Um, it was a you know I nothing out of the ordinary about Hunter. It was it was a I had gone away to school for two years. I had gone upstate to one of the state universities. Because one of the reasons was because I wanted to get away from New York because I felt I, if I stayed in New York to go to college, I wouldn't get any work done because there was just too many distractions. And I was just, you know, I discovered the village and I was just, you know, I was out and about, you know, in my late teens already. So I felt I would uh, um, exile myself to a little town upstate New York where I could focus, cause focus on my college work. And so, uh, what was your major in college? English literature. English literature. So, um, so basically, you came back. You, did they, when did you, when did you come? I back? came back. I came back to finish my junior and senior year at Hunter. I, after two years upstate, uh, I had it. I just, you know, I said, I've, I've, I've uh, you know, I've sanctioned myself enough. Now it's time to go back to New York because I think I can do both. I think I can do my schoolwork, and I think I can also run in the scene. And I think I came back at a very good time because when I came back, that was when the Stonewall Inn first opened. And I had known, as a teenager, I had been able to get into some bars uh, in the east side, the west side, or uh, where, um, gay, you know, gay, where gay men met. But these were very closeted places, you know, nothing on the door, 
you, you, had to be, you, know, you had to get in to talk to. If there was any kind of dancing, it was in the back behind a little curtain, and they would have a signal system where they would flash the lights if they saw anyone come in they thought might be law enforcement. So for me, uh, when I got back uh, to New York in the fall of 67 to, to build a hunter and discovered the Stonewall, it was a revelation because it was first really openly gay bar that I'd ever been to where, you know, there wasn't, you know, there was a doorman, but it wasn't like this was a big secret, you know. And also it was the first bar where I saw people my age, because those other bars I used to go to were always older men, you know. And I was, you know, just late teens, early twenties, suddenly my peers were in there as well. So I was like hanging with people my own age as a gay man for the first time. And so uh, how often did you did you go to were you a regular to the Stonewall? I wouldn't say I was a regular, but I think I went in, I would go, you know, maybe one or two nights a week, I don't, you know, to dance. And um, basically, at the time, I lived in the East Village at the time. I lived near the Bowery. And so basically, the, my social life was in the West Village. I mean, the, besides the Stonewall, there were one or two other clubs we used to go to. Also, there was very active cruising on Christopher Street. In fact, that used to be the main drag for cruising. And um, so, for me, it was just, uh, you know, I would walk over uh, late at night because no one, of course, could get out in New York much before midnight. But there were so many bars that opened and closed, some of the first bars that had uh, back rooms where people could have the, you know, uh, have it on the run, so to speak. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a, a, an enlightening experience because uh, I could see that not that we were empowered, but that we were suddenly more visible uh, than they had been as, as a kid, you know? And then also in the village were again my contemporaries. I was meeting people my age and, and having relationships with people my age, where prior to that it was mostly older men that I met. Um, I met a lot of men when I was in my um, teens in Brooklyn Heights. There was a, the promenade, it's called, the Esplanade. And that was a very popular cruising area. So I got to know, uh, you know, a certain number of, of well-educated, wealthy gentlemen who were educations for me because I would, they would, you know, some were professors, some were artists, and I would learn, you know, just talking to them. I would spend nights on the promenade just talking to these older guys, you know, and it was not a, often not a sexual thing. It was just, you know, learning what their world was, my world, that kind of thing. So I felt living in Brooklyn had been a, had been a good move on my parents' part in that regard because I did learn... Um, I was exposed to the possibilities of, of gay culture, and I feel that my generation was the border generation between the really, the, the bad old days and the optimism that post Stonewall presented. To what do you mean by that? Well, the fact that you could now, you know, that a gay lifestyle was, was possible. Before that, you didn't, uh, you, didn't, you didn't think you could be a gay man. Like I was still thinking about getting married, you know, that sort of thing. You're still thinking about, I have to get married. Um, but suddenly, with st but the, uh, after Stonewall, it was like that had all changed so much, you no longer felt that you had to be closeted with your life. You know, you could live openly, as it were. And uh, basically, I did, you know, live openly, starting in my, um, when I came back to New York to go to finish my last two years of college in 67. I, um, I uh, discovered, uh <laughs> and I had, you know, we had, I would have friends and, you know, we'd hang out and go, we'd go cruising together, go to the different bars. I mean, there was an international stud. What was the other bars we used to go to? I don't remember the names now, but there was, and basically it was all off Christopher Street downtown. And then Christopher Street was around for the Hudson River, and then, of course, um, active cruising started because, uh, on the riverfront down there used to be the West Side Highway, and on the West Side Highway used to park these trailer trucks. And one night I discovered the guys were going in the trailer trucks for, you know, for, uh, for sex. And all. that suddenly became a meeting point for people. You know, you'd go down there, I mean, hang out. I know kids still do that today down along the river where the trucks aren't there, they landscape down there. But that has always been, at the end of Christopher Street, been like a congregation place for, for gay people. In its various uh, guises. And so, can you tell me the, the night leading up? What do you remember? I guess the first inkling of anything going on uh, around the bar on that on that on that hot June night in um, '69. Well, I, as you said, as I said in that essay, I said at one point, um, 
we, my friend Robin and I used to meet up. This was a, it was a Friday night, I believe. And so Friday and Saturday night we would meet up, like we'd go to the Stonewall and dance and hang for a little while, and then one, two o'clock, if we didn't meet anybody there, then we'd start checking out the other place. You know? what, what were the type of people that usually hung out in that bar specifically? Well, it was, uh, it was everything from college boys, there were some you know, older mafia types, there were go-go boys on the, on the bar. Uh, like I said, it was really a, a revelation because we, I had never seen anything like that except in, um, I'd seen that in Montreal when I was going to school upstate. That there was a bar in Montreal that had go-go boys, but for the gay scene in New York, that was a revelation. And they were, they were. What I liked about the bar was, like I said, they were mostly my peers. They were people who legal age, I believe, was 18 to drink back then. And so anywhere from 18 to mid 20s to early 30s was based the basic core of people there. There were, of course, older guys there and everything, but you did know some good. And also, that was the first time that a lot of trans trannies were around. You know, I met Candy. In fact, was it Candy? I met there. Oh, um, anyway, I met a lot of the early trannies who became like Warhol stars later, that kind of thing. So go ahead, back to the house. Oh, so Robin and I, were, uh, I was waiting for Robin um, by the door of the stone wall. It was about maybe, I don't know, 1130, midnight or so. And um, as I was waiting by the door, then Robin showed up, and then there was a little bit of a line, and Sasha was the guy at the door. We had to wait, you know, for Sasha to. Sasha. Well, I don't know his last name. I don't know. He's, I think he's still around. There's another bar downtown. Somebody called maybe he died. Anyway, and I didn't like. I never liked Sasha. I, you know, I always thought he was sort of obnoxious. And um, but anyway, we were waiting to go into the bar, and then suddenly a, 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 a police car, a couple of police cars pulled up in the front of the bar. And the cops were going in, and so Rob and I said, well, we better get out of here. We've been, you know, this is so we crossed the street by the little park, and then we watched what happened, what proceeded to happen. The, um, the police were in the bar, and then they tried to bring out a couple of the trannies, and they, you know, they mistakenly left, they put them in one door, but they mistakenly left the back door open. So they would put the queen in one door, and then he'd step out the back, and, the, and then that's when the crowd started cheering, you know, and they would, and of course, the Queen then had an audience, you know, so they were, they were playing it to the hilt. So they, sometimes they got grabbed again, you know, grabbed and put back in the car because they were, people were, you know, responding to their, to their great exit from the back of the paddy wagon. Or um, and then it really got kind of serious because people started throwing stuff at the, at the club when the cops tried to come out again. They started throwing stuff at the car, you know, uh, bottles, cans, whatever they could pick out of the, uh, there was a trash barrel there too. Uh, they threw the pat trash barrel at the club. Then I don't know, one of the queens pulled a parking meter out of the ground and used that as a battering ram against the door of the club. And so the police barricaded themselves in there. More reinforcements came from the police. You know, the streets suddenly got very busy. And of course, we, at the whole time, we were across the street watching all this. Uh, I did, we didn't venture back across the street. And then at one point, when it was getting really, really crazy, and I, I, I just thought it was good, we were going to have some kind of a police riot. I said, well, l let's walk on. So we walked, you know, we left up to uh, continue the night further away. But basically, I watched the main action of the night before we left. So what type of um, people were doing the, the most fighting back or resistance? Well, I, I would think the more flamboyant were, definitely. There were, you know, there were some uh, collegiate types. Um, but I, I seem to remember... Um, uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of Latin queens, a lot of street kids, you know, who, who kind of had nothing else to lose, you know, were, were very aggressive. What do you mean by nothing else to lose? Well, they were, you know, they were, you know, they had nothing to be in the closet about. They were, you know, they had no great plans for life, obviously, you know, they were just street kids, you know. So, um, and there was a lot of that then back then. There was a lot of homeless kids on the street back then, so there was a great deal of um, of, of that sort of atmosphere, both in the West Village and, and especially in the Lower East Side, East Village, where I was living. And so, um, what was the response? So you kept grabbing them, but what else? What happened? I think, I think I'm trying to understand what was the sort of response of the police. Then was it surprised? Was it? Yeah, they were very. Yeah, they were very surprised that they, that they were fighting back. That they, they were getting actually challenged on their authority. They just, you know, they were incredulous, and so they when they got back up to come in, and then they dispersed, they, the backup dispersed, because the crowd was getting bigger. So that's obviously, they f were trying to disperse the crowd, but it got really angry. Uh, down the street, 
uh, close to the Greenwich Avenue, they'd overturned the police car that had been on its way, you know, had, because the cars had to wait now because they all couldn't line up in front of the club. And so uh, apparently a, a dozen people went down the street and overturned the police car and set it afire. And it really got, that, that's when we left. That's when we said, well, you know, let's, let's get out of here because it, it just looked like the, the police showed up with batons and, and helmets, riot gear. It looked like we were going to have a, you know, a, a real uh, physical attack riot, and I didn't want to get involved in that. So that's when we, we sort of tipped out of there. And who were you there with? Again? My friend was Robin. He was uh, from California. He was a uh, sort of a, a tranny in training. Um, he was very uh, back then. If you wore women's clothes after six p.m., if you were if you didn't wear women's clothes and you were gender, you could be arrested. So you had to wear, if you were going to wear female items, you also had to have some male items on so that if you were stopped or whatever, you could take off your little, you know, your drag piece and still have some men's clothes on, that sort of thing. So Robin was sort of in half, in sort of half, half drag, half male kind of thing. Uh, and he was a... Uh, he was one of the original, you know, flower children from San Francisco. He had gone to San Francisco in his, his late teens and lived on the streets of Haight-Ashbury before he came to New York. And uh, he came from a very wealthy family, Hillsborough, uh, but his family had re completely rejected him because of his lifestyle. So he had no real contact with this one. So he he uh, was was into, he was you know he was living. I, I can't. What was he doing for work back then? I don't even remember, but he did. He ultimately he became a programmer. He did, he went to school for computer uh, science, and he was one of the early programmers. Um, oh, he used to do um, surveys. Right, there was a company in downtown that would do these surveys, and they would hire us for. I think we paid something. They paid us by the hour, and it was basically doing telephone surveys. Um, then I worked for an another company where they sent you out into the street to bring people's doors to do these surveys. So he was getting by on doing surveys back then. And then when after he uh, got, um, went through computer school, he was able then to move into something a little more lucrative. Uh, but he was one of the early ones to, to uh, pass from old age. He, he died in 1984. Or was it 87? I think it was 87, because I came back from work. That, that, that spring. He died in um, July of 87. So what happened? So then you guys left that night, right? So he, we, we, he, we, he, you know, one of the things we were, we, Robin had met Marty Robbins, who became a big activist in the gay rights movement at the time, and so, but I didn't know, you know, at that time he was just one of Robin's tricks, who Robin liked, who Robin was hoping we'd run into again and they'd have another, you know, meet up and hang out again. So um, apparently. That night, I think he did. I think we went further down, um, and eventually, I, I think I ended up going home. And I think Robin told me the next day that he did meet Ro he did meet Marty later that night, and that Marty wanted him to come to. Uh, they, were, they were doing a, a meeting. They wanted to have the Stonewall in incident have some kind of impact, not let it be an isolated incident, but you know, run with this because we have people who are willing to protest police action. So we. So Marty and a couple of the others were felt it's a time to exploit this. And the first thing that uh, uh, Marty organized was something called a hangout, where he wanted us, every, all gay guys, just to come into the village and hang out. You know, the idea was just to show, have a presence. So I, Robin and I gave out the flyers for that, for instance. And I still have some of the original material from that period, that which I. I've told, I've, I have, uh, I don't know if I, I've mentioned it to, see, I've, uh, I was looking for an archive to take it, so, oh, I, well, yeah, well, I was discussing, that's why, how we got involved in this, because I had mentioned to, uh, the archive put out a, a notice that they were looking for people who had experience or had material, and uh, that's, that's how I got involved in it. There had been prior talks with people about giving the material to them, but it never went any place because a lot of these uh, little places just were not really, I didn't feel comfortable giving them something because I didn't know how long they'd be in business. You know, I felt that they, if I gave them these really good archival materials, you know, they may disappear. You know, I think things are a little more permanent now. And so, um, so sorry, go ahead. So the next day. Oh, so the next day we, you know, uh, Marty wanted to set the. I think the Friday night. We, when did I think we did a hangout on Sunday, 
Yeah, it's not that Saturday, maybe more. Well, yeah, there was more. We were on the street Saturday night. The, the club was closed by then because of all that's happened. So, you know, it was just people milling around the street, you know. But, you know, we were basically there cruising, but, you know, we were a presence kind of thing. I mean, it wasn't like, I was never, I, I always said, you know, I don't, I don't want to be as famous as a gay activist. You know, that was my big, big rap. I try to, you know, I said, this is not going to be as the uh, tra tracker of my life. I don't want to be known as a, as a gay activist. I want to be known as a writer. So, so, uh, so that, so you thought you, so that, that second night, yeah, we just on the street. That's all. I don't. I don't particularly remember that night, especially. I think that was when we were giving out the flyers for the next day, which was the hangout that Marty wanted to organize. And then we started. Then, as a result of that, we started going to meetings. There were uh, uh, Mattachine gave them gave us space. At so the I want to go back to that that this weekend. Let me just okay. Talk about okay. Um, so you, that next night, that Sunday, what happened next? Sunday was just a hangout. We were just hanging out on the street. That's it. We we were hanging out. Uh, I think I think we were hanging out in, in Washington Square Park, if I'm not mistaken. We moved it over so that more people could just be present, um, and then we were just milling around. And then after that, well, wait, 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 I didn't. You know, then after that, I don't really remember much because, like I said, we went. I would go. It was, it was Robin's interest in Marty that kept me involved in the early days of the movement because we were we would hang out together. He would want me to go with him because he didn't, you know, he didn't want to go by himself to these things. So he wasn't always sure that Marty was going to be the one to hang with him, you know. Um, so basically, I, like I said, I was a, uh, um, I just happened to be there. I wasn't, you know, it's like my my brother saw me at a, a, a anti-war demonstration and it's the Columbia Missile thing, and I was standing next to a guy being interviewed on for one of the TV news shows. He said, "Yeah, he says there you are." He says the typical uninformed demonstrator. <laughs> so basically, like I said, I, I must admit, I recognized there were possibilities here, but it was not the path that I wanted to take, especially in terms of uh, 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 being known as a, as a gay activist. Or, you know, so at the, also at that time, I had a, um, that, was this, that was also the summer that the uh, Johnson administration put in all those poverty programs, you know. So I was working at a, I got a, a summer job working at one of the centers in Brooklyn in my neighborhood. And at the time, you know, to be active in anything, and you know, as with cameras, there were TV there, print there. So I didn't feel I should throw myself out there because I could, first of all, I would jeopardize a government, you know, I was doing, this is a government job, essentially. So I felt, so I, I kind of held back in terms of my own, this is my activity. I went to all the early meetings, though. I mean, but I never wanted to take a role in in organizing or anything like that. I would go to meetings. If I needed people to make posters or stuff like that, I would volunteer. But I was never looking looking to make my uh, career as a as a, you know active in the gay rights movement. So, so how long then did that process? So you went to different. Yeah, there was a summer. The summer that was that summer, and then. Um, what did, I, what did I start doing that fall? Well, I did start graduate school. But oh, no, I know what happened. I went, I went, I went to San Francisco in the fall, in that, that fall of 59. I met uh, my, you know, my first real boyfriend, and he was going out to L.A. to record a record. So we arranged for me to come and meet in L.A. when the recording sessions were over. And uh, then from there, we went to San Francisco. I was in San Francisco most of 70. I mean, we left in, like, the fall... And I came back to New York in the fall of uh, 70. And so basically I wasn't here that year. But of course, this movement had moved to San Francisco. So there was a, there was a, a day that commemorated Stonewall in San Francisco in Golden Gate Park. So I was there for that. Uh, so there were, there was, you could see that there had been action from this night that had filtered across the country. Um, when I got back to New York in the fall, I could really see that the, the scene had changed a lot in terms of you know, how active Christopher Street was, the whole gay scene in Rome. You know, people were hanging out, people were more open. It was very... Um, but I, you know, I, uh, up until my, um, maybe my mid-30s, I really didn't go around identifying as, you know, as gay. I was discreet, let's put it that way. I mean, I was active. And, I mean, I wasn't hiding anything. 
but I never would, felt the need to be flamboyant about it, like for instance, you know, people who needed to express their gayness in scenes and settings where uh, they would call it guerrilla theater, you know, they would do <laughs> mad things to get, get attention, get noticed, you know. So I was never, I mean, that was never my thing to do. And then, um, I mean, I always look back at it, and I, and I really don't regret that I wasn't more active because I don't think there was any real contribution I could have made other than being a, a body, a supporter, you know what I mean? Well, it wasn't really. I mean, uh, well, until today, like well, well, I don't. I didn't. I wasn't really an activist. I mean, my novel, my first novel, is sort of a uh, take on that time. It's a, I tell a slightly different story, but a, many of the characters in my novel are based on real people from that era. So, um, and I. Um, but remember I mentioned to you there were a lot of homeless kids around. So I felt that the, the trigger for that period were the fact that the, the, an attractive young kid could come to New York and have incredible social mobility. I mean, a pretty boy could really travel up the social scale in New York. And, uh, and I know kids who did through Andy Warhol, through um, the guy who used to be a cultural, senior, a cultural um, minister. So that, I felt, was, a, was the, the spin in my novel, was to show the social mobility of essentially a drug-addicted, you know, heroin addict uh, hustler, basically. So that was, uh, so that, so my, if anything, my activism was to write this novel that I wanted accessible to all people. My, I didn't ever consider my novel a novel that was going to be uh, for gay people only to read. I wrote my novel with the idea that this is that it's open to all people. In fact, my protagonist is the straight brother of the kid who who this story revolves around. So did you? Um, so you said that you had materials sort of from that. Um, yeah. So what what type of materials? Oh, well, basically just the flyer, uh -huh. just any early publications that that we that were being given out, um, because what the the first. Group I think it was called the Gray Gay Activists Alliance, and they were on Third Street, where there's a McDonald's down there on Third Street near Sixth Avenue, and there was a famous club downstairs. I, maybe it was the, the Purple Onions. Anyway, the Gay Activists Alliance had a, had the above the second floor space they were, and that was the first space that, as far as. Uh, the, you were the gay community or the gay acti activist group. And then they had a split. You know, these guys never got along with each other. And then it went from the Gay Activist Alliance to another organization. And this organization then had a firehouse in Soho uh, that they started, and that's when they started giving these dances. That's when it started, you know. But and this all this happened when I came back from San Francisco. Remember, I got back from San Francisco in September of 70. And I discovered that all these things had st were starting to happen. There were, you know, meetings. I would, you know, like I said, I would go, I went to the meetings, I was around, but I never wanted to take any kind of a, a, a leadership role or, or uh, be some kind of a spokesperson. Um, I, I felt I was just a soldier, basically. And I, and, I, and I was comfortable with that because my ambitions were elsewhere. And so today, what do you consider that legacy to be from that period of time, especially if you were there, being able to witness that? What do you, how do you look at your life now versus what it was looking like in 1969 and, and, and maybe to what impact that those two days had on, on just, not just your life, but your life in general? Well, I was certainly um, surprised at how, how far reaching the ramifications of that night were. I mean, you know, I mean, l uh, literally that did spark the, g the gay rights, you know, the, the real gay rights movement. I mean, I know they tried in the 50s with little demonstrations outside the Bell in Philadelphia. Dennis DeCamity was very active, and there was Mattachine, and then we won. I forgot the, les uh, the lesbian, uh, bi biosocialist. There was, there was a pockets of gay activism, or at least gay presence, but after Stonewall, it was completely different. It completely, you know, uh, you know, changed the agenda as far as I can see in terms of 
how we as gay people thought about ourselves and how we were determined no longer to let it be our secret, that we needed to live our lives as we wanted to live them. And I felt that that's what the, the night after Stonewall did. It, it just made it possible for people to have more positive feelings about being gay. Because, you know, you know being gay was not, the, was not a positive lifestyle before Stonewall. I mean, you just, you, you know, you, you kind of wondered, well, you know, how did I end up like this? You know, do I really, you know, is this what I really want? You know, but you can because that's your instincts or, or orientation is that way. But after Stonewall, I think that whole changed. I think, and, and also it brought a lot of young people into the city who heard about it, who knew they could come here and, um, and, and uh, live, a, live, a li you know, live the life they wanted. And also it attracted a lot of, a lot of young kids that came here to, to hustle. I mean, there were, you know, a lot of drugs around. And, you know, it was a very, um, it was, uh, you got to, and also it was the tail end of the hippie era, you know, so there was already free love and the, the anti-war demonstrations were going on and everything. So I think it was dovetailed with all of that activity because there was a lot going on socially in this country at that time, especially because of, you know, Richard Nixon uh, getting elected and everything. So um, I felt that the, it, it's, it's, it, so the ramifications today is that it's burned, it's bur sparked the modern gay rights movement and that we are all benefiting now from what happened that night because it, it, it provided the impetus for a movement, you know, a lifestyle to grow. So that's, that's my take on that. In terms of my own life, I, I think it's, you know, it's been very positive. I mean, it's, it's certainly um, made it possible for me to, to give up the idea that I had to get married to <laughs> to stay in the closet, you know, that that was over. You know, 20 years later, I was about to get married, but that was, that's a different thing. And she knew that my, you know, but um, so, I think it was a good experience to have, you know, that I was there, that I was a witness, you know, I said, well, a reluctant witness because I, you know, it, uh, I didn't really uh, try to exploit it to any real benefit at the time. And um, I'm glad that uh, accidentally I was there that night. Well, thank you very much. Okay. It's a great pleasure to talk to you, Frank. All right. Thank you for sharing that with me. All right. Well, I hope that was helpful. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much.